Hey everyone, welcome to SIG Podcast, a show designed to help you improve your career and investments. I'm your host, Jordan Thibodeau, and I also serve as a community manager for the Silicon Valley Investors Club, an online community where STEM professionals gather to discuss investing, careers, and other nerd topics. Feel free to follow this link and join us. Today, we're excited to have him on the show. He's a financial and operational veteran with over 15 years of experience in some of the most successful companies in the world, including PayPal, eBay. Amon is currently a general partner at Practical Venture Capital, and he will share his wisdom and insights on the recent Silicon Valley bank failure, how AI is affecting the Valley, SpaceX recent launch, Tesla's quarterly earnings, and even the Oakland A's. So if you're ready to enhance your knowledge and boost your investment game, make sure to like and subscribe to stay in the loop with our latest episode. Hey everyone, Amon's joining us. We're going to talk about various topics. We're going to start by talking about the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank. So Amon, let's get into it. Yes. I'd love to talk a little bit about like some of the causes and effects of the, the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank. I've just been fielding a lot of questions from startup entrepreneurs in our portfolio and treasurers in our team who are asking like, what happened? Is it going to happen again? What bank, where should I go? If I had an account at Silicon Valley Bank, where do I move my bank account to? And I've just prepared like a, I can see like a five minute presentation on some of the, the backgrounds and issues with the bank. And we'll go from the specifics of SVB to the more general macro conditions of the banking sector and make it practical for startup entrepreneurs. So first of all, why did they fail? So they were a successful bank, been around for 40 years. They grew very quickly in 2020, 21, had a very concentrated set of liabilities, which will, I can show you in the next couple of slides. They definitely made some risk management mistakes, which I think a lot of other banks are also did last year and are in the process of making, but it just hit SVB a lot harder than any, any of the other banks. So you can see where this is the bank balance sheet. So they had assets and liabilities. Every bank has these assets are what you own, liabilities are what you owe. On the left-hand side, you can see they had 212 billion in assets and then the Q4. On the right-hand side, they had 195 of liabilities. So in banking finance, the difference between assets and liabilities is book value. That's about $17 billion, okay? So far, so good. Now, in any bank, you want to figure out, like, what is the quality of the assets? And are those going to hold up during different types of economic scenarios, what the Fed calls stress testing? If we go ahead a page, here's the good news with respect to Silicon Valley Bank. A lot of their assets were in loans. $74 billion of the 212 were in loans. And I've gone through all their financials and figured out were the loans getting repaid or not. And it turns out that it looks like they were collecting on all their loans. So they were getting paid back on their capital call lines, their loans out to startups, to tech entrepreneurs, the home mortgages they had done. They'd done some like sponsor buyouts and some private equity lending. And it seems like all those loans, for the most part, were performing. There's, I've coded them green, yellow, red. Green is like performing loans, really no issues. Yellow is, yeah, maybe, maybe problematic. The bank disclosed some issues. Red was maybe an issue where they were running into some trouble. But it seems like there's a lot of green on the page, not a little, not a lot of red. So you wonder, how does a bank that has a performing loan portfolio, how does it go bankrupt? It wasn't just their, it wasn't their loan portfolio that was a problem. The problem for them was actually in the other stuff. What is the other stuff you ask? SVB had grown so quickly in the past two years that they couldn't lend fast enough. They were taking in deposits more quickly than they could lend out. So they had most of their balance sheet sitting in other stuff, what they call HTM or held to market securities. That was mostly in mortgage backed securities, residential and commercial, but basically mortgages. In this country, there is not a mortgage payment problem, not right now and not yet, but people are paying their mortgages. Unemployment rate is like three and a half percent. The credit default rates on mortgages are like near all time lows. So how is it possible that a bank has a mortgage portfolio problem? They, unfortunately, they bought all these mortgages when interest rates were really low. The, this is a mortgage backed securities index, which tracks basically the price of mortgages in the US. You can see from 2013 on the far left-hand side, these bonds had generally had a pretty good up into the right run. And all of a sudden in 2021, they skyrocketed. The value of the bonds went off the charts high because interest rates were super low. When rates are low, the price of bonds are high and vice versa. And so SVB was basically buying bonds right at the very peak of that market when rates were super low and where the prices were way up high. In fact, rates in 2021 were something like, I think they had all time lows in 2021. They, the, we began tracking interest rates for mortgages back in 1754. And the mortgage rates were lower in 2021 than at any time in the entire history since 1754. 
So right as rates were at 400-year lows and the prices were at 400-year highs, SVB decides we're going to put a whole bunch of money in these mortgage-backed securities. Rates began to rise. You can see what happened in 2022. The price of the bonds plummeted and the value of their portfolio dropped. And at the end of Q4, they said, hey, we've got like a $15 billion loss on these bonds that are brewing. Not just SVB, mind you, but a lot of other banks are making the same or have made the same kind of mistake. The value of $15 billion is a really important number. So remember their balance sheet before. They had $212 billion in assets, $195 in liabilities. That $15 billion loss basically wiped out their entire book value, wiped out the difference between assets and liabilities. So they're essentially worth zero. Now, they told investors in Q4, like in February, they did their earnings release, and they said, hey, we've got a $15 billion problem. It's not an issue. We have a plan. We're on it. So the market didn't panic back in February. But it took notice. And somewhere in March 8th and 9th, Silicon Valley Bank said, we're going to sell some of these bonds at a loss, but we're going to sell them to raise some money. We're going to raise some equity from investors. Well, that plan didn't come together. The equity investors didn't bite. The roadshow failed on March 8th. On March 9th, at the speed of Twitter, all the SVB customers began talking, hey, the bank's in trouble. Their book value is zero. Better pull your money out. And $40 billion walked out the door on the afternoon of Thursday, March 9th, which, you know, has never happened before. Like people communicating to each other by Twitter and instant messaging precipitated a bank run and then the bank failed. So the bottom line is there were risk management issues that SVB made, asset matching liabilities and risk management issues that under, that took them under. Other banks are in a similar or maybe not as dire situation, but in a similar situation. So my advice to startup entrepreneurs is, look, there's going to be a, another whammy to hit these regional banks over the next year or so as rates stay elevated and these bond prices are depressed. All these unrealized losses have to work through their system. God forbid if there's a commercial mortgage problem, if people start defaulting on commercial property or have to refinance at higher interest rates and can't do it, these regional banks are still exposed. So what you really want to do is open a couple of different bank accounts with a couple of different bank accounts with a couple of different banks. Keep your deposits under $250,000 in, in a particular account. You can go to any bank and you can open up a savings account, a checking account, and a money market account. So you've got three accounts, so you're now protected up to $750,000. Some banks offer a money market sweep account, so the money goes out every night and goes to a bunch of different FDIC-insured banks, so they're all covered up to a million or more, comes back the next day with interest. It's actually a really good thing now that interest rates are 4 or 5%. And if you have more money than a million and a quarter, a million and a half in your bank account, well, congratulations, first of all. But if you have that much to protect, just go buy treasury bills or commercial paper for 30 days and don't take the risk of having your money sitting at a regional bank for that's uninsured. What I also found interesting was there's a lot of different venture capitalists and CEOs of companies who talked about how pivotal SVB was in their starting of their company because SVB went out on the limb and gave them financing and capital raising. So... Part of me thought that they would all come together maybe and try to rescue SVB, but that didn't seem like it materialized. Yeah. I think it's hard for the depositors. There's so many, if you look at the amount of money that SVB had, we're talking 15, $17 billion in, in book value. And to be able to stabilize a bank like that and restore confidence is it's probably tens of billions of dollars. That's just not something that the venture industry or small businesses can can scrape together. That's that's a pretty big ticket item. And you also can't really blame. We didn't advise our customers to leave SVB exactly, although I gave them the same advice I just gave you, which is, hey, just open different bank accounts and protect your money. But when a bank's in trouble and you've got your money sitting there, it's hard to tell a startup entrepreneur to keep their money in harm's way. Oftentimes, these startup entrepreneurs are like 22-year-old engineering majors who don't understand finance, you're the adult in the room, your advice should be protect your treasury portfolio. The bank is going to fail or not, but you can't save it yourself. And your responsibility is to you, the shareholders of your company and your employees, you better keep your money out of harm's way. And so it's hard for them to, it's hard for any startup board, I think, with a straight face to hear any other advice than that. I completely agree. I also heard people making comments saying, you put your deposits in that bank and it failed and you should have done your due diligence. I, I don't know about you, but like when I go to a bank, you know, for my you know, a checking account, I'm like, let me see your balance sheet and what's your, what, how many treasuries do you have in this? And what's, it's like, 
You don't audit the bank before you open the bank account. (laughs) You don't don't, don't comb through their financials with your... If I was at your level, I'd bring in my uh, my accounting team. Like, before I put my $1,000 in, here are my accountants to come look at your books. Yes. Um, (laughs) I love the free toaster, but, you know, what is this HPM portfolio? Can I just get an audited (laughs) statement of what is in there? I think the better way to frame that argument is every startup, every bank customer should know, knows or should know, that there's an FDIC insurance limit. If you walk into a bank, there's a sign that says your money is protected up to $250,000. So they should have known that there was a limit to the, uh, the insurance. And if, if they had more than that, there is some maybe responsibility in the customer to, uh, to manage the money safely. It's like saying, hey, I want to buy, I want to rent a car. I should know that I should be insured, but if I decline the insurance and then I get into an accident, don't want the government to help me out. I guess I do want the government to bail me out because it's in my own interest. But is that really what society wants? And I do feel like customers should have some responsibility. But there's no doubt that as I talk to our portfolio companies, there's no doubt that they didn't know. No one really understood deposit insurance. Maybe they should have and maybe they will now. But it's, it was an unfortunate situation, which I think luckily it, the government stepped in and protected those depositors. But I think now it's incumbent on every CFO and every treasurer to understand the rules and protect the money. So the next time they're not get, they don't get caught in that situation. Definitely a good learning lesson. So thank you for sharing that presentation. So it's all in the rage right now, AI this, AI that. And so I'm sure you're seeing plenty of pitch decks. Just love to hear about what your thoughts are in general in the market, what you're seeing out there. Well, we're, so we're not AI investors. I think we are, we are watching the, watching the game unfold. And there are definitely a lot of startups that are pitching towards that. I think I would just draw the line between Artificial intelligence, like AGI, artificial generalized intelligence, and something that is broad, but not specific to a vertical or an application or use case. And then there are a lot of companies that are using AI for, to solve a particular application or a particular problem, which I think five years ago, I would have called machine learning. And there's some variation of, of AI now that is application specific and vertical specific. As long as it's solving a real problem, I think that is something that we would look at and consider at investing. It feels like the, the AGI is something that will take a long time to get to something really useful. I think ChatGPT is it's mind opening and it's incredible what it can do. Um, but it's really the domain of really big, well capitalized companies right now. If you're a startup going up against Microsoft and Google, I think that's just a hard. That's a, that just seems to me like a difficult putt. And I think the you're better off serving a small, narrow niche customer base with a real specific problem and a use case, and having a machine learning or an AI technology that solves that. And that's something that I think investors will appreciate. Short of that, I, I feel like it's the next bubble that's forming. Venture money sometimes goes in these waves. And I think they've gone from NFTs and crypto and Web 3.0, and they've skated right to this new AI puck. And I don't know that the valuations are reasonable. And I don't know that there's enough money, that the money will be made by the companies that we think will make them. What do you, how do you feel? Like, what do you see something in the market that would tell you like the it's time it's come, or do you think it's still, it's still it's forming? Really- when ChatGP3 came online and I started playing with it, I was like, wow, most of the things that it does here are things that I've paid a lot of money to do. Yeah. I'm getting all this done now for fractions of a cent. So there's value here. Yeah. But as you astutely mentioned, there is also a lot of hype. So everyone is jumping in. And if you, most of the AI projects I've been seeing is they're cool use cases, but mostly what they're doing is they're getting Python they're getting UI and they're just plumbing in chat GPT three or another M and yeah. it's great. But I talk about this concept of the path of progress talk about in real estate, like you want to invest in the B minus areas because then hopefully they, over time they might j- uh, turn into A areas or whatnot. Okay. And some companies all fall prey to when Microsoft came on the scene, they're going to build products that like Microsoft's eventually going to get to it's almost there. It's like naturally windows is going to get, into this yep. product space. Yep. And so I see some folks who are building those types of things. And I think if GPT continues to progress as it is, like right yeah. now, GPT 3's context window is small, but four is much bigger. And eventually if they keep on fine tuning it, a lot of these startups use cases, we're going to naturally be gobbled up by it. Yeah. So trying to figure out what the true value is there is one thing that I'm concerned about. And then the next thing is if AI is, you made a really good point about there's AGI people are talking about, which is like a social mission to a degree and investing in that's very tough. Okay. But saying I'm going to use focused intelligence onto a narrow space that you mentioned makes a lot of sense. But I look at it as if you're going to go for the latter, 
how much money do you really need to get that thing off the ground? Do you mm -hmm. really need to take a gigantic venture capital check? If you're using this technology properly and the way it's set up, you need to be a couple engineers who actually know how to properly use Python, a good business case, and maybe you could bootstrap what you're trying to do. So that's, that's my take on it, but I'm not in venture, just a guy who likes to nerd out on it all. Yeah. I think the questions I'm trying to figure out as an investment. So mm -hmm. the, if you remember how the search engine wars played out in like the late nineties and 2000, it's, if you invested in search engines, like as a, an index bet on all of them, you would have done great. But if you would have invested in Google and maybe Yahoo, you would have done great. And maybe MSN, or I don't know how that investment would have worked out, but, but what if your investment had been in all the other search engines that had that had been developed and that failed, whether it was Alta Vista or Ask Jeeves or web crawler, um, hotbot, or all the ones that didn't make it. And how do you tell the difference? Like before you've got some runway and some traction and some, some demonstrated use cases, how do you really know where the value will accrete to? It's possible it just goes to the big, to Microsoft and Google and a handful of really big companies that have the capital. They also have the data and the information, like the building an LLM model that's useful in part, there's an exercise in technology. Can you actually, do you have the engineers and the chops to be able to build something that then has the attributes of AI? But once you do, where do you, what do these LLMs learn on? What information do they gather in order to, in order to improve? And there are only, there are a handful of places that, so chatbot has done a great job, but it's been, it hasn't been monetized to date and they've just used the internet, right? Everything that's out there and publicly available and they're just crawling the web and they're able to benefit essentially by free writing and all this content, but they can do that without violating any copyright laws because they're basically not monetizing. The minute you start monetizing now, copyright becomes a real issue. And what if, you know, all the sources of data like Quora or Craigslist and eBay, Amazon, are they just going to give their data away for free forever? And if they don't and they, or they start charging for it, or they start creating a walled garden and maybe licensing it to a handful of competitors. That seems like that really changes the playing field as well. So I, would, I think I'll try to ask like, where do you have the technological chops to solve a real problem? One, but then two, what is your source of information? What is the, what are the models going to learn on going forward? And do you have that locked up? And is that proprietary? And is that something you can really protect over time? Because the answer is no, then I don't know how you maintain your competitive advantage. That's a really good point. And the idea of, you know, the internet got off the ground, it was pretty much like a lot of sharing, you could crawl websites, get all the information over free, but yeah. now it's, oh, we can create models off that. But wait a minute, I spent all this time building this business to put this, create this data set together and you're yeah. just scraping some and making money off of it. And I, I go both ways because I'm benefiting so much from GPT and part of my heart breaks that Reddit's going out there saying, now we're going to charge for API calls. Yep. And I'm like, I understand it, but I also realize, wait a minute. A lot of your content is shelves like me posting on there plus community mods. So it's real, it's really murky, but your point regarding, do you have some type of proprietary data set that's just yours? It's valuable. Yes. It reminds me of a startup I was working with. They were, they're creating this product where they connect you to doctors and then doctors can answer your questions via chat app. And sure. I was reading a paper on how they're using chat G some companies using chat GPT, or sorry, researchers using chat GPT three to see if they can answer medical questions. And they were able to answer them with 90% accuracy, but that yeah. was with no feedback whatsoever. And it dawned on me, I was like, oh, wait a minute, that startup I was talking to, they have all those doctors now, they could do reinforcement learning. And that would be a solid use case for AI right there. And I would say a decent moat compared to saying, just go out there and crawl the internet and use WebM WebMD. Yeah. No, definitely. Yeah. You, you made great points there. The thing, I think the thing we'll run into when they start monetizing is the, uh, there's a four factor test in the law when it comes to what is a copyright infringement. And one of those is one of those factors is like the effect on the market and monetization. And if you're saying I'm using, I'm using WebMD and medical opinions that I've gotten from a whole bunch of different sources, I'm not making any money. In fact, I'm quoting and attributing, you know, all those different in the kind of correct way, then that would be fair use, meaning that's not going to get prohibited or challenged in a court of law, but. The minute you start taking that stuff and making money off of it, which then affects the web MDs or the doctors or whoever you're pulling this information from, if you're affecting their ability to monetize and to make a living off of it, now you're going to trip into copyright law. So you have, it's, it'll be incumbent on you to figure out how to, way to, a way to compensate all those people, to license the information or to demonstrate that there's, you're not affecting their ability to make a living by taking their stuff and repackaging it into something that essentially competes with what they do. So I think it's easy to believe that. 
AGI or AI as a social good can, can work in kind of an open sourced way where no one's making money off of it. The minute you commercialize, though, I think it, it, then you're in violation, I think, of copyright laws. As I understand them, that they're, as the way they're written today, whether they evolve or maybe they change, I don't know. And maybe there are ways to license around it, but it's just not obvious that's where this, this, where, that's where this goes. So you think there's going to be a court battle to happen to fully settle this? I think if you're, yeah, if you're out there on the web right now and you're making money by giving medical opinions and, and you're posting answers on WebMD or Quora for that matter, then you're, whoever you're working with will either bake it a walled garden so that all the AI chatbots can't scrape them or they'll, or if you, if they are being adversely affected, I think you've got a potential legal case. Yeah. Interesting. So yeah. let's see what happens when chat, when chat GPT turns the revenue on. It'll be interesting to see. So recently Tesla reported their earnings and this, I think the stock went down about 10% or so. I'd love to hear your perspective on what you think about the company. And also you think about the, the competition that's coming from the older companies, the older car companies, GM, Ford. Toyota, I think that's going to have a material impact on Tesla going forward, or if they're going to carve out their own niche and say, we're going to be the high-end version of electric cars. I've been a, not that big a believer in Tesla, at least in the valuations they've generated over the past couple of years. I just think maybe the valuations are headed where they're at. I think what the street reacted to this time was revenues were like up 40%, which was fine, but their price cuts in order to stay competitive or to keep scaling are putting pressure on profitability and their unit economics. And that's, that's been an ongoing thing with them for at least the last couple of years. And that's what maybe made the stock trade down, but it's such a richly priced stock that a lot of stuff has to break right in order for the, for it to keep appreciating in the last year or so, it's just been, they're down something like 50% or something in the past year. I think as a result of just money's not free anymore, they're still executing it doing well. So I don't think it's as much their results as just the macro environment and, and the way they've been treated because of the longevity of their cash flows being way out and money no longer being free. And I think they're probably after this last trade down, it feels like they're, they're, uh, they're probably okay. Maybe a little bit on the expensive side. I can definitely see the competition coming. I think every, every car maker is going to be launching EVs in the next couple of years. I don't know that will be anywhere near as good as Tesla. I think they've probably got at least a five-year lead on, at least from what I've seen. So I think they'll keep doing well and keep growing. So I do think I'm a long-term believer. I still don't love them at this valuation. I still feel like they're a little bit on the expensive side though. It's a great product. Everyone I know loves it. <laughs> so that's a good sign. Plus all of his other responsibilities. I got on Twitter and SpaceX and now he's trying to dip his toes into AI. So oh, really? Uh, he I hired a few people and he's trying to start his own AI company. I think it's called Truth AI. And uh, he thinks that ChatGPT is too locked down. Okay. And I think he has an argument because sometimes I ask it questions and it's, sorry, I can't answer you that. Or it gives me this parenting mode where it's, you shouldn't be asking that question. I can't do it. It's, I get it. I'm an adult, but I'd love to get the answer I want from you. <laughs> and <laughs> even Sam Altman's come out. Yeah, we understand. We don't like that either. We're going to try to fix it. It'll be it's interesting to see that. Not to, not to answer a question because you, yeah. hey Jordan, you should not be asking that question. You should not know. Why do I yeah. lose a guy in 10 days? No, nope, exactly. you should not be asking that question. Are there, yeah. is there really, is there really yeah. a, is there a separate <laughs> way here that I can cheat on my law right. exam without creating a black flag and getting thrown out of the law industry? Nope. You, we will not help but cheat on the bar. <laughs> we will not, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And they don't want to go the way of Microsoft's first chatbot where within 24 hour period, people are able to get to say a lot of inappropriate stuff. So uh -huh. I get that, but it's like, all right, we need to allow the, allow me to take the parental supervision controls off at some degree so I can kind of do what I want. We are investors in SpaceX. So mm -hmm. I would personally prefer it if Elon would focus on maybe getting two things right and not nine things. Yep. And maybe seven of the nine will, will be right and two of the nine will go wrong. But God forbid SpaceX is one of the two that go wrong. I would rather he just focus on one thing at a time. I want to talk to you about SpaceX. They had a launch this week. You are an investor in the company. I'd love to hear your point of view on it. Yes, we are. We are investor. Yes. So I've been following pretty, pretty reasonably carefully over the past few years. I think this week was actually quite momentous for the company. The, uh, the basics of it is that they were able to get their new rocket ship, which is called Starship, off the launch pad. If you look at the headlines that have been reported in, I guess it was just Thursday and, uh, and Friday, so like April 21st and 22nd, I just did a scan of the headlines and I missed the importance of it because I think the media got it all wrong. And what I mean is if you look at the like the Wall Street Journal and New York Times kind of led with Starship rocket explodes. There's their, it took off from the launch pad, but exploded before it got to stage separation. CNN went with the same thing. New York Times was like, 
start rocket goes boom and leaves a bunch of Texans with a mess, like we're referring to all the, the debris and I guess the noise that happens and is accompanied with every, uh, every launch. And so I was, I did the scan of the headlines and I was like, wow, this feels like a little bit like a mission failure. And I actually spoke to folks at the company. Hey everyone. Hope you're doing well. That sick is a bootstrapped operation. So we depend upon donations from viewers like you, especially these viewers here who are our current Patreon supporters. Look at those names. God, winners, all of them. I, they're just wonderful human beings. They're photogenic. They're hardworking. People love them. I just, they, they just, they're people who make America fantastic. And you can be just like them if you decide to donate to our Patreon. And if you donate to our Patreon, you get freebies, free courses. You get to suggest who I should reach out to. Yeah, don't go to me and be like, go reach to Michael Jordan. I, but like, give me, give me someone who I can like reach out to who's not as high as Michael Jordan, but not a crackpot. You know, someone like no, because I mean, you get, you get Michael Jordan on the show, and then he sees his background sketch. So if you're thinking. Like, what can I do to make it so that this show continues and get great guests? Join our Patreon. Support me. Support Svick. Make Svick fantastic. Anyways, back to the show. Talk to you later. Bye. So we are investors, and I spoke to folks at the company, and it's been reading more about what the general space community feels. And I think the company sees it as a success, and most of the space community sees it as a success. So if you set aside all the headlines, what you don't realize is that the company didn't really expect the thing to get into orbit. It, the first time, if you remember, they, they did the Falcon 9. This would be back, I guess, in 2016. Like the first couple of Falcon 9 launches ended the exact same way. It got up off the ground. It was a mini win. It exploded, but you, it's iterative learning and it's developing a new technology, right? So stuff fails, but you learn and move on. It was never expected to get into Earth orbit. And so what they were able to prove is that they've built a new spaceship, a rocket ship. It got off the launch pad, which I think people at SpaceX thought was a 50-50. Like that, that fact alone, I think, makes it a win. The spaceship got past the point of max Q, which essentially means it, it's able to take the kind of stress and resistance that's going to happen when it goes to outer space. So they proved that this is the spaceship that will take us to Mars, which is actually exciting. And I think the company would see that as a, as a rather momentous win. Yeah, I, I'm very bullish on SpaceX, and I was following the story about how they finally cracked the landing boosters, so no longer do they have to use boosters and throw them away, which supposedly saves them like $45 million a launch or something, so that was like huge, but then after that, I haven't been following as deeply, and I saw the news narrative of it exploding, and I was thinking to myself, either the booster is supposed to reland, so is this a failure? And so I'm glad you cleared that out, because I was hooked on that too. Uh, yeah. So also like talk to you about is just you invest in the company for a long time. Talk about it's like it's revenue streams. I know it partners with NASA. Now it's got Starlink. Maybe you can talk about those for a bit. Yeah, I think it's basically, it's essentially two companies in one. I'm sure Elon would say it's a lot more than two companies in one. There's at least two companies in one. One is space transport generally. And this Starship in particular, I think it's just been a game changer as far as the economics of getting stuff to outer space. As an example, if you look at the Falcon 9 metrics, the variable cost on the Falcon 9 is something like, I don't know, 15 million in variable cost to ascend 17 metric tons into orbit. The Starship is something like $2 million in variable cost to get 100 metric tons into orbit. So it's basically five times the mass going into outer space at 15% the cost. So I guess do the math and it's like a 50x improvement in the internet economics of getting anything to orbit. So there is going to be a rocket ship company in SpaceX, which is getting stuff to the International Space Station. It's probably going to be within like, if those unit economic numbers are right, it's probably also going to be cheaper to fly things into orbit and to, let's say China, if you want to ship large amounts of stuff to China or to even to Europe, like transatlantic cargo delivery might be a thing of the past within five to 10 years. And then there's, I'm sure there's going to be a space tourism and people will want to travel to outer space. But I think the major revenue streams are working with NASA, getting stuff, supplying the space satellites and or su supplying the, the space station, and then getting satellites into orbit and whatever else NASA and governments need. And that's the, principally, that's the business that I think we thought of and we invested in. The other business is just Starlink, which is like a satellite communications business. It's essentially enabling internet by doing it, doing what Verizon does or T-Mobile does, but just doing it through satellites as opposed to through like landlines or or through the wireless technology that exists today. 
And that could be, that just could be a bigger, better, faster internet. And I think right now, my guess is Starlink could spin off from the company this year and could be worth like half the market cap of the company. So I think it's at least those two companies in one, and maybe there's a bunch of other stuff in there that I'm missing as well. I also just one thing, one credit for Elon is he's an amazing recruiter. Uh, yeah. Gwen Shotwell, who's the number two in that company, absolute rock star. Have you met her by any chance? Yeah. I have. She's yeah. We've spent some time together. She's really incredible, and she provides great leadership for the company. She's been there, I think, almost the whole way. At least through, I met her back in 2010. She's at least been there for 13 years and has assembled a really good team. Which is, I think, what Elon needs. He's a great visionary. He's a great ex executor as well. But he's, he's spending time on Tesla and Twitter and a whole bunch of other stuff. The fact that he's got a leader like that actually. For me, that's the most successful of his companies, and I think wins a big reason why. I think this week will go down as a really good week for anyone who is interested in space travel. I think it's great. It's a great American company that's doing great things, and I think it's I think it's a real win for American business. It's a little unfortunate that the media didn't see it that way, but it's uh, I guess that's just part of the part of how things go. Part of the game. And then also in other news, it turned out that Google did reorg an AI space. Looks like Demis is now the CEO of all the AI groups there, and I thought that was like a really important message to the rest of the industry that Google is now serious about what's going on in that space. And so I'm hoping that this reorg allows them to set their priorities straight and they're able to launch more AI and actually be a competitor in this place. Yeah. What, I guess the purpose there is the reorg will give them more focus and additional clarity on who gets to call the shots with respect to their AI division. I guess that's a good thing. And I guess it's a way to marshal resources in a more organized way. And maybe it's more effective. Having been in large organizations before, eBay was the biggest company I was at. And we, I remember when the analog for us would have been mobile, we had mobile embedded in different business units. So it's possible that one unit was doing something that was right for them, but maybe not prioritizing or resourcing mobile efforts in say the product team, the way that the business team wanted to, or that maybe made sense for the overall product. And if one person has all the levers for product and marketing and the R&D for it and the policy, maybe that at least it works together more cohesively. It certainly feels like Google should be a juggernaut. And if you go back to what makes AI successful, technology, yes, the quality of engineers, yes, but also the information, the data, the ability to learn, to have LLMs that learn off of a prior data set. I could, I could imagine that like Google's got a Gmail division and maybe they had a Gmail, doesn't want the data in Gmail being used to fuel the AI LLMs for whatever reason, maybe this is not the right thing for Gmail or maybe there's some privacy concerns or what have you. But, but if somebody can make use of all of the different resources across Alphabet in a way that then supports that AI effort, that's got to increase their chances. And I think it comes down to, can they leverage and marshal all the search data, the query data, the Gmail property, YouTube. And if that, if this AI team can access all those different pockets of information and have a killer engineering team seems like Google ought to be a top, I guess you said third before, but it seems like they ought to be a top three, top two player in AI long-term, no? Who else has that set of assets to go after the problem? I can't think of anyone. Maybe Microsoft, but even then. Yeah, that's a really a great point because it, let's say they are able to put out an LLM that was as good as OpenAI, like ChatGPT, and they had that integrated to every touch point at Google. Like, yeah. Why even bother to go to ChatGPT? I'd, yeah. I'd be able to go to YouTube and be like, hey, can you summarize what's going on in this conversation? Change channel for me. Go, then go back to Gmail and be like, oh, three people got emails. Can you like respond to those two? And they can be back to what I was doing at YouTube. Having that AI overwatch and then also having it in the cell phone, I, that must frighten open AI. And I think that's why they yeah. have been running scared, trying to get, hopefully get this GPT-4 plugin model out so they can start tapping into different resources. If Demis can align all the orgs like you mentioned, then yeah. I think look out to threat. And I think it's a more compelling integration than OpenAI with Microsoft. Hmm. So far, OpenAI, GPT being integrated into Bing, people are not happy with it. They're saying, hey, one, there's some ads that are being injected into it. People don't like that. Two, the responses don't seem to be as good compared to going to chat GPT directly. Yeah. Now, so far as having it integrated into Microsoft Office suite of services, I think that's going to be a really compelling offering but i think with google you only you have their version of office but then you have all the entertainment apps of youtube and whatnot and the podcasts and youtube music where having ai integrated there is even more compelling yep i think they have the opportunity they just have to be able to realize it yeah yeah i would agree yeah the end game for them there may be like three or four major winners with ai that are all mm -hmm. the more 
I guess the more subjective and the more useful and interactive it is, it seems like you'd want, you, you may, I can envision having a, a, a summary of a document that I want, maybe inspiration for a book or something I'm writing and wanting one or two, a couple of different opinions on it. So I can go to whatever Google's product is, Bard, I can go to ChatGPT, Microsoft. Hey, I read, I want to hear what, what Siskel and Ebert, or just now Roger Ebert has to say about this movie. And I also want to hear what Rotten Tomatoes says. And I want to get a couple of different perspectives to form my view. The way that search works today is I need one, right? Because I'm just looking for something very specific and actionable. And I'm not going to go do the same search three times because I don't need to, but maybe a lot of use cases for AI, a couple of winners will emerge. It certainly seems like Google ought to be one of the top, one of the top two or three in the space, given their assets. Definitely agree. Yeah. Last thing, shifting gears, you're a sports fan. Uh, we were talking a bit about Oakland A's. Any thoughts about them leaving because they bought some land in Las Vegas? It just seems it's not fair. We already lost the Raiders. We're already losing Tesla. We're already using our best and brightest from the Bay Area to like Las Vegas and the Sun Belt. They have to take the, they have to take the A's too. <laughs> yeah, what's logical is if I look at the population of Oakland over the last, I don't know, since 1990, they haven't gotten any bigger, right? It's a city of about 400,000 people now. It was a city of about 400,000 in 1990. Do you know what the population of Las Vegas was back in, like back in 1990? No idea. Yeah. Gosh, half million. It was it, it back in 1990. It was around 250,000, and today yeah. it's 700,000. The city is it's bigger than and, and Oakland is like 400,000. Kudos to Las Vegas. They've gotten to become a real city. They're bigger than Oakland. They're, I think, bigger than Oakland and, and Berkeley combined. They're basically as big as San Francisco. San Francisco is about 700,000 now, I think, after the last year and a half of losing 10% of their population. So it feels like they're, Vegas is actually a great sports town. They're, they've got hockey right on the strip, and they've got a fabulous hockey team. And I've been to games. That, it's like half of Vegas show with like cheerleaders and the Golden Knight and, yeah. and the whole like medieval times restaurant vibe. But then there's like an actual hockey game that goes on and it's, it's a really good experience and the city's fun and you're not going to get mugged or killed any, anywhere except in the, except in the casinos. If you try to knock him over, they take <laughs> exactly. it really seriously, <laughs> if you but yeah. if you're not a bad guy, you will have a great time in Las Vegas and in Oakland mm -hmm. or San Francisco for that matter. It's these are smaller dwindling populations and they're just not as competitive. So I guess it's just, I guess it's, it's, it's probably good for, it's probably good for baseball to have a, a sport like that in, in Las Vegas. I'm sure they'll do a, a good job with the, with the A's. It's a little unfortunate that the team seems to be ready to move, but I've also been to games in Oakland and the stands are half filled and, and they're three and 16 this year. So I guess I can't really blame the fans, but even when the A's were competitive, it felt like they weren't, it wasn't the most vibrant or exciting atmosphere over in the Coliseum. So. Exactly. And the Coliseum's been long over <laughs> to be remodeled. Yeah. It's just too dreary. I had the, yeah. the, I think I believe it was called Oracle Arena where the Warriors used to play in Oakland. That yeah. was okay, but it just seemed like the call scene was just really bad. It just, right. it was just a bad vibe. Right. And you go across the bay and you go over to 18, what's it used to, call, used to be called AT&T Park, I forgot what it's called now, the, the yeah. giant stadium. And it just feels like Fenway of the West Coast. It's just so great. an it's amazing so great. feeling. And it feels like I'm walking That's called Oracle, history. Oracle Park now. Oracle Park, yeah. yeah it used and to be the, Bell. But it's a pretty ballpark. It's set against the water. It's very iconic. It's a real special place. So I guess ultimately what's good for baseball is having parks like that and experiences like that. And yeah. o Oakland's loss might be Las Vegas's gain, but it's good for the sport. Yeah, that makes sense. Be interesting if I saw a Lakers fan. I, I'm okay. I have no ill will against the <clears throat> Warriors. I'm happy they're doing well. i um, never had any animosity or anything. But then I'm also a 49ers fan, and I want to see the writers fail at all costs. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But then I'm a Giants fan, and I appreciate Oakland. It was because American League versus National. We never got – I feel I feel sad seeing it happen, but I question you is, do you think you're going to see A's fans say, I'm hanging it up, I'm going to go to the Giants and support them? Or do you think you're gonna, people are going to hold on and say, you know what, I'm going to stay true blue, true A's fan no matter what, no matter where they go? I don't know. I think, what do we see with the Raiders? Did Raiders fans just transfer their loyalty to the Las Vegas Raiders? They went down to LA for a period of time. And yeah. I think the fan base held on and they came back to Oakland. They're still there. Yeah. And I suspect they're still, they're still loyal. They're sad, but they're still loyal. I have a friend actually who's a hardcore Raiders fan and he yeah. still follows them. He was crestfallen. Still follows them. Yeah. Yeah. The A's yeah. have such a rich tradition, but it's distinct from the Giants and it's such a rich tradition going back so many years. I would guess that most of their fans will still have a real fondness for the team. And if they can watch yeah. it on TV and Vegas is only, it's only an hour flight away. Yeah.
I, I bet they'll do a decent job of holding on to a lot of that loyal fan base. And then they'll build their own vibrant Las Vegas fan base. That is a, right. that is actually, it's just based on the population and people who live there. Forget about all the 2 million people who are like there at any given time because they're traveling on vacation and want to catch a game. I think they'll get a lot more new fans out of it, but I bet they'll hold on, they'll hold on to a, a bunch of their old fans. Yeah. And I was surprised that the NFL deciding for the Raiders go there, being that there's such a huge sports book and gambling operation in Las Vegas. Yeah. I was like, oh, I don't think it's going to happen. And now baseball's down there too. So, hey, see how it goes. But again, yeah. I'm on. Thank you for your time. We really appreciate yeah. you. Hey, thanks for joining us. If you'd like to see more excellent content, check out these two videos and don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks.